And while you're waiting for us to start, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. You can include your name and where you're joining us from tonight. And also if you attended any of the other events that we've had in the environmental justice series, feel free to share something about those, like a lesson that you learned or something that stuck with you from those previous events. I know I got to attend two of them and thought they were excellent and I'm sorry that I missed the others. Um, so I'm glad to be, be at this one tonight. All right, in the interest of time, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. I know we've got a few more people trickling in and as you're trickling in, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you would like to. My name is Jenny Abel. I'm the volunteer chair of the Great Waters Group of the Sierra Club and I'm also on our Small But Mighty Equity Committee and I will be moderating tonight's event. We have lots of great volunteer leaders who are going to be sharing information with you about their experience and work that they've done. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and dive into some introductory remarks as um, before we get started with that group. We wanna thank all of these organizations that are listed here on this slide for the wonderful help that they provided in spreading the word about this and the other environmental justice events uh, that have been a part of this series. So many, many thanks to all of these organizations. So I want to take a moment to recognize that here in, in Wisconsin, we're living on land that for thousands of years was stewarded by and then ceded from the Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi nations. Through this statement, I want to acknowledge both that we're living on and working on stolen land and that Indigenous peoples are not a relic of history but are here today surviving and thriving, building and sustaining vibrant communities. Wisconsin has a strong native presence with 12 tribal communities, including the Bad River, La Cordere, Lac du Flambeau, Red Cliff, Sacagan or Mole Lake, and St. Croix Bands of Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, Stockbridge, Muncie, and the Brothertown Nation. To learn more about the history of the land that we live on, please visit native-land.ca. And I'll put that link in the chat uh, when I stop screen sharing or someone else can insert that in the meantime. But if you go to that site, you can enter your zip code to learn about the uh, native peoples who have lived on that land. In our work in the Sierra Club, may we respect the sovereignty of the 12 First Nations of Wisconsin and strive to use the history of, de of colonization to inform our shared future of collaboration. January 6th was a violent and deadly attack against all Americans, against our country, our democracy, and our freedom as voters to choose the leaders that represent us so that we have a government of, by, and for the people. So this January 6th, exactly one year later after last year's insurrection, Americans across race, place, party, and background are holding candlelight vigils to say in America, the voters decide the outcome of elections. The promise of democracy is not a partisan issue, but a calling that unites us as Americans. To prevent this kind of attack from happening again, our elected leaders must pass urgent legislation that will protect this country from anti-democratic forces who are continuing their efforts to destroy it. Tonight, you're going to be hearing from Sierra Club volunteers about how our priority issues intersect with social justice, especially race and economic equity. 
Then our panelists will have a brief discussion about how they got involved in environmental justice work and continue to make that a priority of their volunteering. I'm about to introduce our panelists, all of whom are active Sierra Club volunteers. We thought it was critical to recognize up front that Sierra Club's volunteer base in Wisconsin, while not 100% white, is majority white. We recognize that Sierra Club has not always been inclusive and welcoming to people of color. One of our top priorities is to address unwelcoming or toxic behaviors that have led to our organization's majority white leadership, membership, and involvement. Panelists who you'll be hearing from in just a moment are Emily O'Neill from our transportation team, Soren Warland from the Beyond Coal team, Grace Johnson, Tar Sands, Dave Bluen from the mining team, Diane Kane from the wildlife team, John Strudel, Lambs, Jadeen Sonoda is going to be representing the water team tonight, and David Thomas from my own Great Waters group and an organization that he leads called Nearby Nature. Before we hear from the panelists, I'm going to pass the mic to Kelsey Sari of the Wisconsin Chapters Equity Team to talk about lessons that we've learned from the environmental justice series and what's next. Thanks, Jenny. Um, like she said, my name is Kelsey. I use she, her pronouns. I'm in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and I'm here representing the equity committee. Um, just want to share some feedback from the series. Um, overall, the feedback from the event attendees was overwhelmingly positive. People learned something new, had their perspectives challenged or changed, and were engaged both emotionally and mentally. With the feedback we got from the attendees, event partners, event speakers, and event planners, here are a few lessons we learned and are using moving forward. We will continue robust promotion of events and ease for partner organizations to support events and spread the word. The fact that this was an event series with dates set well in advance helped with event promotion and resulted in strong attendance. Attendees did say they wanted more and follow up emails after the event, such as more resources, more calls to action, and more future events. The moderators of these events will practice pronunciation of speaker and guest names and will prepare their presentations with a focus on limiting microaggressions. We will continue engaging diverse partners and speakers and prioritize those speakers to talk first and or longest. A curious observation was that while Sierra Club has been working on many of these issues with a focus on environmental justice, many attendees commented that they were happy Sierra Club was starting to care about these issues. Additionally, excitement, partnership, and attendance in these events was greater than other Sierra Club events, even those that have a focus on disparities in access to opportunities, public health impacts, economic impacts, and other racial justice and economic justice themes. It is worth considering why the buzzword environmental justice in this event series title drew this response when similar events without that buzzword in the title do not. Sierra Club is interested in continuing to host events focused on environmental justice that don't just use buzzwords, but that name specifically what the issue is and what communities bear disproportionate impacts from those issues. And I'll hand it back over to Jenny. Thanks a lot, Kelsey. I'm gonna hop us back to our list of panelists for just a moment, because I want to make sure that you all get to see the great folks who we're gonna be hearing from tonight. So at the national level, Sierra Club recently released a set of core values which are grounded in equity and inclusion. Those values are anti-racism. We commit to shifting power away from white supremacy repairing harm and ending structural racism. Balance, our effectiveness comes from committing to caring for ourselves and others. Collaboration, we believe in just relationships that support collective work. Justice, we're accountable for our actions, our work and how we show up with trust and respect. Transformation, we commit to changing our relationships to power, privilege, and oppression for ourselves and for the organization. 
Sierra Club's mission statement remains the same and many of the things that we value in the world, public lands, time outside in nature, clean air, clean water, and wildlife continue to be priorities for the Sierra Club to protect. I'm moderating today's panel as a member of the equity team of the Great Waters Group of the Sierra Club. These new values at the national level of the club has adopted our priorities for the Wisconsin chapter and for the groups throughout the state. So now let's turn it over to our panelists to learn about how these values are manifesting in the work that they're doing. Emily, can you start us off by introducing yourself and providing a quick overview of your work? Yeah. Hi, I'm Emily O'Neill. I'm part of the transportation team. Um, our work is basically we advocate for better local transit. Um, we focus on basically everything besides cars because cars get a lot of the privilege already. So we focus on public transportation, biking, um, pedestrians, et cetera. Um, we do this because um, for health, more cars and more air pollution um, increases childhood asthma rates and worsens other health conditions that disproportionately affect low income and black communities. Um, we do this for climate change, um, for racial equity. Um, if you know the history of cities in Wisconsin, such as Milwaukee, um, then you know how some of the highways have affected particularly the black community. Um, and predominantly black neighborhoods were split to create um, the I-94 and 43 originally. Um, so some, those are some of the reasons on why we do that and how it relates to environmental justice. Um, we do our work by, talking to our reps, um, letters to the editor, submitting public comments, attending public hearings, and advocating for a bigger public transportation budget. Um, last year, one of our focus um, was getting the word out about Fix at Six, um, which is a proposal to um, the uh, uh, a more sustainable and just version of the I-94 expansion or alternative rather to the I-94 expansion um, that was created by several groups in Wisconsin, including the Sierra Club. Um, and that was one of our main focuses last year. And you can read more about that at fixatsix.org. Um, our, our next focus is on Transit Equity Day, which is um, February 4th, 2022, which is Rosa Parks' birthday. Some of the things we did last year um, included like free bus fare, events with le legislators, media events, um, roses and cards for bus drivers, um, city council proclamations, ride alongs and things like that. So we're planning on doing a lot more to bring attention um, and awareness to public transport and to celebrate it and to celebrate people who ride buses and people who drive our buses. So that's kind of what we have next and a little about the work we do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily. That's great. Soren, can you tell us about your work with the Beyond Coal team? Yes. Um, so at Beyond Coal, our focus is both on um, pressuring utilities to shift away from coal-fired uh, power plants, as well as um, spreading information among the public that counteracts some of the um, misinformation that we need fossil fuels such as coal for a reliable energy system. And this work is very important to environmental justice because the pollutants from coal, whether they are from um, toxic coal ash dumped into waterways or airborne particulate matter from smokestacks are disproportionately affecting low-income communities and communities of color. These toxins increase the rates of diseases such as asthma and other respiratory diseases, but can also increase the baseline rates of cancer, heart disease, and other types of chronic ailments. And closing down coal-fired power plants will relieve this um, unjust burden on these populations and moving to clean energy results in a better future for all. And over this year, we had a major success in a long-term campaign to get Aligned Energy, one of the major energy providers in Madison, to close down their Columbia coal plant. So this was um, many years in the making, and um, we're very happy to have this success. And we've also been starting a um, misconception series where we debunk some of the ideas that um, either green energy isn't reliable or 
um, our most recent one, that natural gas is a transition fuel, when in fact it has serious consequences for vulnerable communities and is not as pollution free as individuals think. So, yeah, you know, we both focus on actually moving to green energy and um, debunking misconceptions about green energy and fossil fuels so that we have more people on board with the rapid transition away from coal and towards renewable energy. Great, thank you, Saren. Grace, I'm gonna turn it over to you next. All right, hello, I'm Grace and I'm on the tar sands team. And what we primarily deal with is pipelines that transport tar sands oil. For those of you who may not know, tar sands is a particularly insidious form of crude oil that is open pit mined and then transported via pipelines for very long distances. And part of the reason that tar sands is of a particular concern for environmental purposes is that it's a different consistency than normal crude, which means that it sinks to the bottom of waterways and is often incredibly hard to clean up and borderline impossible to detect until it has spread a very far distance. And why we are part particularly interested in tar sands work and engaging with environmental justice is primarily for the purpose that, number one, many pipelines break treaty agreements and trespass on native land and reservations, such as the Bad River Reservation in northern Wisconsin. And companies like Enbridge, the Canadian fossil fuels giant that runs these pipelines, like Line 3 and Line 5, has been particularly averse to respecting the treaty rights of native tribes and organizations. And it has proven that it does not care about the health of those communities and of communities that are also exposed to the water that is in danger of being polluted by those tar sands. Additionally, sort of a side effect of that is during the process of construction of these pipelines, camps of working men typically are often situated near native reservations and pose a greater threat to sexual and physical violence against native women, queer people, and two-spirit people. And so what we really like to focus on with Tarzan's work is tribal sovereignty, the right of native peoples to decide how to govern, how to use their lands, and their ability to collect food. Because for example, line five, a pipeline that we are currently working against is in a position to pollute many of the waters in which the Bad River Band of Ojibwe fish and gather wild rice. And so it really proves a multifaceted issue that poses direct harm to Native communities among other communities. And in this foregoing semester, sort of half of the year, we are focused on the draft environmental impact statement, which was recently released by the Wisconsin DNR. Essentially, that statement evaluates the environmental and socioeconomic harms that further construction of Line 5 could pose. And so we are currently in a massive campaign to try to get people to turn up to either leave comments or testify against the pipeline and sort of raise awareness about what is at stake when building these dangerous structures. Thank you for all that work, Grace. Dave Bluen, can I turn it over to you next to talk about your work with the mining team? Hi, sure, thanks and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in tonight. Um, so I'm the longtime mining committee chair for the Wisconsin chapter of the club um we work primarily on metallic mining issues uh so uh base and precious metal mining proposals as well as uh, the taconite mining proposals uh and then uh, to a lesser extent on the frag sand mining issues um they pose much of the same issues that the tar sands team um is running into with uh, working on the pipeline issues across northern wisconsin where uh, these proposals disproportionately affect uh, rural communities, 
uh, our, our tribal nations um, and uh, you know all all communities that uh, are um, uh, you know in in poor shape to be able to fight them and, and take them on. Uh, currently, we're working on uh, fighting the Back 40 mine proposal that's uh, alongside the Menominee River on the Michigan side of the river, directly across from Wisconsin. Uh, and, uh, and then we're also tracking, of course, uh, any potential mining develop developments in Wisconsin. Uh, there are only a handful of potentially economic deposits, uh, uh, base and precious metal deposits in Wisconsin. Uh, but they're all in very water rich uh, uh, areas uh, and, uh, and, and, and again in rural communities uh, where the impacts would be uh, widespread uh, and, and uh, obviously detrimental. Um, and, you know, we do all of this just because, uh, uh, not just because, but primarily because uh, the, the impacts from uh, metallic mining uh, are permanent. Uh, and uh, uh, they're both short-term and permanent, and that's really important uh, that we uh, oppose them where uh, it's appropriate to do so. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, I'm gonna hand it off in just a second to Diane um, to talk about her work with the wildlife team, but I notice also that some questions are popping up in the chat. And um, Grace, I noticed there's one about line five. So I wonder if you'd be willing to answer that in the chat. Um, that would be great. All right, Diana, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm with the wildlife team and the wildlife team led by chapter director Elizabeth Ward filled me with pride this year as we broke barriers by disrupting the status quo of the Wolf Advisory Committee, which historically uh, disregarded science, transparency, and inclusion of Indigenous people during the STEP period. In May of 2020, the wildlife team became aware of the intent of the Wisconsin DNR to limit the um, 2021 Wolf Advisory Committee to only nine stakeholders, including hunting, cattlemen, trapping, and agricultural groups, with only one group to represent wolves. The wildlife team successfully fought for for inclusion of the tribes, wolf advocacy, animal rights, forestry, conservation, and environmental groups to ensure a fair representation of interests. The end result became 29 diverse groups called the 2022 Wolf Management Plan Committee. The DNR Wolf Harvest Committee, which convened in May of this year, or of 2021 included the wildlife team also to discuss quotas for the November wolf hunt. Despite a public allowed public outcry asking for a zero to minimal quota, the DNR set a quota of 130 animals with the tribes claiming 50% of the wolves in ceded territory and that's per the historical Voigt decision. Wolves are a spiritual brother to the Objibwe. While many felt the DNR's wolf quota of 130 wolves was too high, the, the Natural Resources Board increased the quota to 300 wolves, and that did prompt an interesting rebuke by DNR Secretary Preston Cole, and I am quoting him verbatim. You are manipulating the number based on tribal declarations. On its face, it's damn near illegal. You folks are so out of bounds. The wildlife team provided access to a must-see short documentary called Friends Pro produced by Rain Bear Stands Last, highlighting the wolf's plight and the urgent act need to act to protect wolves. In October 2021, Wisconsin's Judge Frost issued an injunction requiring the DNR to set a zero quota for wolves for the November hunt. The injunction was filed at the request of Animal Wellness Action, Center for Humane, for a Humane Economy, Project Coyote, and Friends of Wisconsin Wolf. Judge Frost is expected to make a final ruling on this lawsuit upon completion of the 2022 Wolf Management Plan, and that's expected in June of 2022. Six Wisconsin tribes sued in federal court arguing their treaty rights are being violated under state management. Judge Peterson ruled not to issue an injunction to halt the Wisconsin's wolf hunt because the state order is, always in, is already in place. However, he's prepared should to issue a ruling on this if anything should change. 
In November 2021, six environmental groups in a California federal court challenged the decision to delist the wolf. Earth Justice filed the lawsuit on behalf of Sierra Club and five other groups. We await a ruling from Judge White, and we are waiting. And thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you so much, Diane. Passing it off now to John to hear about your work with the LAMS team. Thanks. Hi, so I'm John. Um, so as a team, preserving and promoting public lands is one of our primary goals. And with that, making sure that the parks are accessible to everyone and not just a luxury for the rich is extremely important to us. Um, members of our team, probably like many people here today, frequented parks as kids and that kind of shaped us today and got us into environmental activism. Um, and we want to make sure that children from low income families also have that ability to kind of share in these experiences in the outdoors. Um, and this can kind of take the form of preserving and maintaining parks in low income neighborhoods. Um, we're trying to make other parks more affordable um, and have usable transportation to them since not everyone will have the time or the means in order to make it out to like a state park. Um, so a couple examples that we did um, in 2020, we did a scavenger hunt. Um, where we kind of hit a couple geocaches and we specifically chose to hide those in county parks, which have free entrance, um, no fee versus a state park that costs, I think it's about $25 um, each year um, or like five bucks a day. Um, and then another example has been our um, Every Kid Outdoor campaign, um, which is to make state parks um, free entrance for all fourth graders. Um, this is part of a national campaign where if you're a fourth grader, you can actually enter any national park for free. Um, and we we're trying to get it there. So the Every Kid Outdoors campaign had overwhelming support in the, the Congress or Conservation Congress. Um, and now there's a bill trying to get through the committee. Uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Jadeen from the chapter office is gonna be talking to us a little bit about the work of the water team. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I'm, I'm really only stepping in very briefly because um, we, wanted um, this to really be volunteers speaking about their experiences. Um, but I didn't want to forget one of the big issues that we work on, because um, I know a lot of people really care about water throughout Sierra Club and throughout the state. Um, so I just really, really, really wanted to um, uplift and highlight some of the water issues that are impacting communities across the state. Um, so for example, we're thinking about how PFAS contamination impacts tribal communities that are relying on fish for a portion of their diet or how rural communities are facing, facing um, the harsh impacts of nitrate contamination from CAFOs um, and black communities in Milwaukee, especially dealing with lead contamination. Um, so these are issues that the water team really cares about and is working on. Um, there's actually a PFAS hearing today and there are comment period, it's open right now. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too much depth, but just wanted to lift up that these are issues that we also care about. And there are a whole team of volunteers who are really passionate about them. Um, and we're putting a ton of really hard work into fighting for strong water regulations to protect um, public health and communities and to fight for environmental justice. So thanks. Thanks, Jadeen. And last, but definitely, definitely not least among our panelists is David Thomas, who's gonna be talking about the work of nearby nature in Milwaukee. Thanks, David. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, thanks to everyone on the on the team here who's doing just amazing work. And um, the um, the work of nearby nature is a little bit different from uh, what other folks have spoken about. It's it started out as a Sierra Club, Club project in 2017. The Great Waters Group um, or a group of people from the Great Waters Group applied and got funding from the Sierra Club Foundation uh, to do environmental justice in Milwaukee, work in Milwaukee, <clears throat> and then. Uh, when that, when that grant ran out, we um, we came under the fiscal sponsorship of the Milwaukee Environmental Consortium. And I'm just going to uh, share my screen here, uh, if I can. Let's see. Um, the, um, the, the work of Nearby Nature, um, you should be seeing the website. Um, let me know if it's not showing up. But our, our work falls into uh, four different areas uh, that goes along with our mission statement. And our work uh, starts, starts with youth programs and um, more or less follows the model of the Urban Ecology Center, but 
the the area that we prescribe for this project is along the Lincoln Creek Greenway and the 30th Street corridor and most of that area is outside the service area of the ur current urban ecology centers so we're currently running uh, uh, four uh, concurrent youth programs in the uh, spring and fall and um, and still developing our summer programs but um, we uh, work with approximately 50 kids each uh, each session, and it's uh, led by uh, Martina Patterson, who's pictured here. And um, then um, our uh, outings program, we have a, a program that we uh, bill as a, a green space equity program, where we lead outings into the community. Uh, last year, we did about 30 outings. It includes uh, hikes, bikes. Um, we were inspired this year by a group in Chicago called Chicago Adventure Therapy uh, to uh, really expand our, our paddling uh, program. And so uh, we held uh, several paddles this summer, uh, culminating in, in one that was predominantly uh, First time paddlers and um, and predominantly African American uh, participants, and so uh, over the the four years that we've been going, we feel we've uh, really been pretty successful at building a uh, a multiracial program. Uh, another part of the program is uh, celebrating uh, the environmental movement in the African American community, which is is uh, very uh, vibrant and full. And um, and so far we've honored uh, 25 leaders in the African American community uh, with these Pioneer Awards. It's been a very popular program, and it's coming up again uh, this coming February. And then the uh, the final area is uh, we're dedicated to doing anti-racism work, and primarily now that's being led by Mandy McAllister. And there's a a, prog a program that she's operating uh, called uh, building a multiracial environmental community, and um, and I hope everyone will take a look at this. I'll post a link in the uh, in the chat about this. Um, but um, so far in, in the last uh, round, I think uh, I think over 50 people participated in study groups and 16 or environmental organizations signed up to be committed partners to that project. And so that's uh, a quick overview of nearby nature and uh, and what we're doing. Great, thank you so much, David. So, and so many thanks to all of our panelists. Just to let you know a little bit about how the rest of the session tonight is going to go. We've got about a half an hour available for some prepared questions that I'll be asking to our panelists. Um, we'll be ending with some calls to action and ways that you can get involved. And our, our plan is to wrap up um, by 7.15 to let you get on with the rest of your Thursday evening. So I'm gonna start off with our first question. What does environmental justice work look like to you? And Surin, I'm gonna ask you to respond to that first. So if you could give us some insights on what environmental justice work looks like. In yes. Um, so first and foremost, environmental justice work moves us past the idea that we must sacrifice the health of some sections of the population in order to provide energy for the nation. Too often people dismiss the idea that our current system of power production lays an unconscionable burden on vulnerable communities because they believe that is simply the price of living in a modern country. Environmental justice means working to produce an energy generation system that resolves climatic, racial, and economic injustice. Coal-fired po power plants, um, as mentioned earlier, are disproportionately located in communities of color, meaning that these areas suffer from the brunt of these toxins emitted by these plants. Pollutants from burning coal increase the rates of a host of chronic disease from asthma and other respiratory illnesses to cancer and heart disease. Uh, we can't ignore this kind of justice and our type of environmental justice must work to address these health disparities. In addition, natural gas often touted as a bridge fuel actually increases the risk of water contamination with toxic, frac 
toxic fracking chemicals causing cancer, respiratory, and cardiovascular diseases in those living in the near vicinity. It's the most impoverished communities that bear the greatest brunt of these externalities from fracking. Environmental justice work means putting pressure on utilities to stop burden burdening the most vulnerable and marginalized with the toxic byproducts of energy production. It means shedding light on these disparities so that more people will be become involved in the fight for a healthier future for everyone. Great, thank you, Saren. David, Thomas, could you respond to that same question? What does environmental justice work look like for you? Uh, thanks, Jenny. Um, well, first of all, I, I think that um, environmental justice can't really be separated from social justice. And uh, most, of, most of the folks here know that the Sierra Club has taken a strong stand uh, on, on issues of affecting uh, minority communities, for example, uh, supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, calling for reparations. Um, but there are so many, uh, so many issues. And, and one thing that came up in um, an environmental justice roundtable that I, I, I uh, work with is uh, someone uh, brought up housing and, and how is housing a, an environmental issue. But um, in, in, the, uh, in the Black community in Milwaukee, uh, trash and illegal dumping is a huge problem. And, um, and there's just such a, a, a large percentage of renters and, and people who don't own their own homes. And, and it really affects quality of life. Uh, it affects how, how involved people can be in their communities. And, um, and so um, it's just a very uh, broad ranging issue uh, that uh, intersects with everything. So great. Thank That's how you. I look at it. Thanks, David. Dave Bluen, can I turn to you with the, the same question? What does environmental justice work like? look like to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so my involvement within the Sierra Club goes back to uh, the early 1990s, but it's sort of founded on uh, the, the uh, uh, and somebody already mentioned it, the, the, the 1983 Voight decision recognizing uh, Ojibwe treaty rights uh, and the, that recognition led to a lot of racial strife, uh, violent and racist protests uh, throughout the 1980s uh, up in northern Wisconsin. Um, you know, protests by white property owners and fishermen and, and fisherwomen. Um, uh, it, but then it intersected, you know, with the first wave of so-called modern mining proposals in Wisconsin. And so traditional you know, uh, sort of top-down uh, environmentalism, uh, uh, you know, coming along at the same time, being uh, being concerned about mining proposals uh, at Lady Smith and Crandon here in the state. Um, so, you know, we started to work with uh, the tribes uh, starting in, actually in the early 1980s, uh, the Le Couture Band, uh, and then later on with the Menominee and the Forest County Potawatomi, uh, as well as uh, a number of the other uh, Ojibwe tribes. Um, what that looked like um, very quickly uh, got grounded in um, Native American tradition, which is uh, based on the talking circle, uh, based on collaboration, based on listening. Uh, and understanding uh, uh, the issues uh, that these communities, not only the tribes, uh, but rural communities were faced with. So, um, and I should also mention that I, I participated um, in a lot of work by the Midwest Treaty Network uh, at the time that was built around that sort of same sort of uh, collaborative process where, uh, where it was so important to, uh, to listen uh, and to recognize that you're judged by your actions uh, far more than, uh, than your words. Um, so, you know, that's really colored how I've looked at how we deal with these issues that uh, we come from a place of privilege in a place of, of, um, uh, of, of more resources. Uh, and that it's so much more important that we understand that our job is to support those communities uh, that are in need uh, and to listen so very carefully. 
Great, thank you, Dave. Grace, I wonder if we could get your perspective on that question. What does environmental justice work look like for you? Absolutely. I think that environmental justice and the work that supports it is in direct rejection of two things. The first being environmental racism and the second being ecofascism. Now, for the first point, environmental racism, through environmental justice, we ensure or we work to ensure that all people, especially those of marginalized racial, ethnic or socioeconomic groups, have the same access to clean water, clean air, green spaces, nutritious food, and other environmentally based factors that more privileged groups do. And working so that disparities like toxic Superfund sites and other environmental factors that severely influence human health and well being are not disproportionately burdening low income communities, communities of color, and other marginalized or at risk communities. The second part that environmental justice rejects is eco fascism, which I'm glad to see that we as an environmental movement have started to move away from in the past couple of years, but there still are notions out there that, for example, overpopulation is a source of climate change or significant factor in climate change, or that certain groups should be prevented from having children because it's, com it's uh, adding to climate change and other adverse factors. And so I think that it's really important through our environmental justice work to tackle these racist or classist elements in environmentalism, realize how they've been embedded in the tradition of environmentalism, and see a future in which rather than resorting to strategies that divide or blame people for the damage that humans cause on this planet, that we work together to make sure that everybody has the resources they need and the ability to live in a way that is sustainable and that centers the needs of those who have been sort of least supported in our current society. Great, thank you so much, Grace. John, I'm gonna turn next to you with a different question, but before I do that, I just wanna, um, mention to attendees, if you've got questions that are coming up for you, feel free to put those in the chat and our panelists or staff will answer those. So feel free to enter those. Um, but John, the, I'm gonna turn to, like I said, I'll turn to you with the next question, which is what are some methods of system change that you engage with? Yeah, um, I think one of the most important ones has been um, this past year, I, I, I got the opportunity to kind of go and speak at some public hearings. Um, this is the first time I had ever done that. So it was quite a nerve wracking experience, but it was kind of really rewarding after it. Um, and I think that's kind of a really important thing for people to do. Um, I don't know who said it first, but um, I heard someone say that legislation is written by those who show up. And um, with COVID one, kind of nice opportunity that came out is that a lot of hearings have gone virtual. So it really kind of lowers the barrier um, with your ability to actually testify at these things. Um, so in, in addition to that, I've also massively upped the amount of comments I've submitted and times I've reached out um, to the governor and other local elected officials, um, just kind of campaigning and making sure that they hear my voice. Um, and that just really helps them as to like, if they have an issue that they're kind of unsure if they want to kind of force it, um, having, they know that like their, their constituents want it, that kind of gives them the extra drive to go for it. Or if they didn't know that we wanted it, it, it really helps them to hear that this is actually something that we want. Um, but even on a, on a kind of a smaller scale, um, other things that like you can kind of really do is there was a park nearby where I like really frequently would walk my dog and there was a dumpster that anytime the trash would be picked up, well, a couple items would always just kind of blow out right into the park. So I actually went out and got one of those poker sticks um, so that anytime I could walk by after the trash went out, I could just kind of quickly just grab a couple of those things. And every time I did that, you'd always get thanks. And I did see other people starting to pick up the trash more often. So I think just kind of small things like that are really good ways to kind of 
promote and get people to start taking action. Thanks. Thank you, John. Diane, um, if I could turn it over to you with that same question, if you could tell us about methods of system change that you engage with. Well, what I do is um, I serve as a, a WCC delegate representing my county, which is Jackson, which is in West Central Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin Conservation Congress is also known as WCC. And it's unique to Wisconsin as it is funded to represent all Wisconsin's citizens concerned with our natural world. However, the WCC represents a disproportionate number of hunters and trappers. There's very few non-consumptive users that service WCC delegates, nor is the makeup of the WCC very diverse culturally or by ethnicity or gender. Um, I promoted greater inclusivity by authoring and sharing a resolution proposing term limits for advisory committees, which was passed in eight counties. But anyone, these, these um, the second Monday in April, um, there's Spring Conservation Congress hearings in every county um, starting at 7 p.m. throughout the state. Anyone can be a WCC delegate. Um, you have to run, you have to get elected, uh, but it's a very important thing to do. And a lot of people don't know about it. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, I didn't know about that. So that's, that's great information. David, I'm gonna pass it on to you with the same question, um, getting your perspective on methods of system change that you're engaging with. Uh, methods of system change. Uh, I, I had a little trouble with that question, but um, I guess um, I've got a list here. Uh, one is is a, a resource that August Ball shared with uh, our group, uh, and it was a, a website called 75 Things You Can Do to, for, uh, for Racial Justice, or specifically 75 things white people can do for racial justice. And uh, now they're up to uh, 105 things. I'll share that resource in the, uh, in the chat. Um, and so there's no end to the list of things you can do. Uh, and people are always asking me, especially once we finish a presentation or a study group, you know, what can we do? Um, and an, another resource that uh, August Ball shared with us was uh, a video uh, from the, uh, um, the author of a really good uh, book for educators, um, the author Bettina Love, um, made a statement that, uh, well, white, white privilege is kind of like an ATM. Um, we've been, uh, if you look at the skills and resources that you have in life, uh, a, a lot of them, uh, you know, of course, we've all worked hard to earn what we have, but uh, it came about as, as opportunity opportunities we had that other people didn't have. And, and so any skills, uh, resources, or talents that you have can be, uh, uh, can be that ATM that you go to to, uh, to make change in, in society. And um, another thing on my list here is that um, on a grant application, I was asked, uh, well, what kind of cultural competency do you have to, uh, to carry out this work? And what they were really getting at is, uh, if you're going to work in, in an African-American community, what, what's your cultural competency for doing that? And the, uh, the key is, uh, first of all, that, that, we, uh, that we hire and, and build an, an African-American uh, staff and, um, and board uh, leadership, and um, and that whole uh, leadership issue, uh, building and mentoring uh, leadership from the communities we're, we're trying to work with is is just so important. And and I heard it said that uh, if you're not if you're not building leadership in the community where you're working, you're basically either a missionary or running a plantation. And so that's uh, just a really uh, critical thing that I always keep in mind. Thank you, David. Um, I know you mentioned August Ball, who's one of my personal sheroes. So I put a link to her organization, Cream City Conservation, in the chat. Um, 
Emily, I'd like to turn it over to you with a different question, a new question. Why is personal work related to anti-impression, I'm sorry, anti-oppression important? Why do you think personal work related to anti-oppression is important? Yeah, I think I would argue almost that personal work is almost more important than your outward work is the internal work. Um, I think a lot of reasons for this one, one is so that you don't keep causing harm. I think we're all products of the society that we grew up in and that comes with a lot of not so good stuff. So being able to do the work yourself, you have to dismantle the oppressor mentality within you first before you try to do it systemically. Um, especially if you are doing outward action, a lot of times you are joining spaces that are led by um, BIPOC people and you don't want to go into those spaces thinking you know everything or you're the best or you know just making um, people's lives worse and perpetuating more harm. I think that's one of the most important reasons. Um, another reason I think is because this work can be really hard and it can be tiring and it can lead to burnout really fast. And when you are knowing what you, why you do this work and how you want to do this work, I think there can be a lot of joy in the work and there can be you can figure out kind of where do I fit in in this world and how can I help the best and how can I do this in a sustainable way where I'm not gung-ho for uh, two weeks and then all of a sudden I'm burnt out and I don't want to do anything anymore. So I think those are the two main reasons why I think personal um, internal work um, on anti-impression is so important. And Grace, I'm gonna pass it over to you with that same question. Sort of to build off what was previously said, everything that we externalize into the world through our work comes from the perspective that we have as a person. Therefore, you cannot produce quality work or affect quality change in the world without first examining your background, your motives for engaging in certain types of work, and sort of recognizing how the role that you play in broader systems. For example, I went to, I currently go to UW Madison and my first year I was in a learning community that was based on sustainability. And there were certain people who made fun of other people or shamed them for not knowing how to properly recycle. And clearly, the fault uh, was not on those people for not knowing how to recycle, but rather just the fact that there was a stigma around that lack of knowledge, perhaps based on class, perhaps based on where that person grew up. And so it's important that we focus not only on the end goals of sort of what effects we want our work to have in the world, but the motivations behind the actions that we take and sort of how we're framing certain issues, especially when it comes to marginalized communities. Great, thank you, Grace. And Dave, I'll hand, Dave Bluen, handing it over to you with the same question, why is personal work related to anti-oppression important? Oh, sorry, I was, I didn't unmute. Um, I, I struggled with this question just a little bit too. I guess when I look back on my experiences with working with marginalized communities, such as, um, you know, our, our native uh, nations uh, and our, our rural communities, uh, towns, villages, counties um, in Northern Wisconsin are, that are faced by extractive projects, um, you know, it just goes back to, I, I think, learning not only to listen, but to ask the right questions and to find out what it is that um, we can do most to help, um, to park your ego, to, to know that we're in a support role. Um, I guess that's sort of what I've internalized when I, when I think about my journey uh, uh, on working through these issues. Um, 
I guess I'd offer if any of our other panelists have <laughs> more insights than I do, uh, maybe you could, maybe they could raise their hands and you could call on them. But that's that's kind of where I'm at when I thought about the question. And our next question is kind of related to this, and I'm going to start with Soren for this one. What are some examples of personal work that have been impactful for you? One recent project I've been very fortunate to be a part of is setting up a series of blogs and videos to debunk some of the major misconceptions about green energy. There are many people who think environmental justice is important, yet might oppose measures to shift rapidly to green energy because they think that these changes will result in a greater burden to poor and minority communities when nothing could be further from the truth. The first installment in our misconception series debunked the myth that green energy is not reliable. With this work, we sought to demonstrate that rather than resulting in a riskier energy supply, green energy has the potential to fulfill all of our energy needs in a reliable manner. In fact, green energy, and in particular home solar panels, would be of particular help to low-income communities of color who suffer a disproportionate energy burden, or the percent of household income that goes to paying energy bills. In the latest blog, we address the myth of natural gas as a bridge fuel, which um, is a belief even among those who know that we need a rapid transition to green energy. So even in those who have very good intentions on um, re removing some of the injustices in our energy system, there's still this um, myth that persists and prevents us from um, gathering more allies in a truly just transition to green energy. Natural gas is no solution to our energy problem, and it's important that this message gets out there to avoid, avoid promoting policies that will endanger the health of impoverished individuals around the nation. There are so many well-meaning people out there, and it's important that we're all on the same page with respect to what a just energy system looks like. I feel fortunate that I've been able to um, produce this blog to at least um, try to correct some of this, this belief and hopefully get more people on the side of all renewable energy rather than um, fossil fuel systems and maintaining these fossil fuel systems that still um, um, cause vulnerable communities to bear a significant health burden. Thank you, Saren. I'm going to turn it over next to Diane with that same question. But Diane, before you begin, I just want to acknowledge the great comment that Katie put in the chat. Um, I had never heard this, be hard on systems and soft on people. I think that's something great to keep in mind. So Katie, thank you for sharing that. Diane, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Well, personally, what, what I've done, um, we, we have a family agribusiness. It's been started by my husband and I, myself. We have a lot of Native American, Hispanic, Amish, Mennonite um, people as part as our clientele. We try really hard to make them feel appreciated and welcome. And surprisingly, in our community, there's a real need to edu educate the, po um, the public about tolerating the Amish. And so we we have probably 200 Amish customers that people see all the time. And we work hard to facilitate tolerance. We've hosted a wildlife day on our farm with over 150 attendee attendees and three scientists and biologists serving as speakers. I spoke on behalf of wolves at local 4-H clubs and women's clubs in an attempt to promote tolerance of wolves in our community because um, it was, we are home to the Central Forest Wolves. Um, in October of 2021, I attended a wolf rally in Washington, D.C. Started at the Washington Monument, and we marched to Lafayette Park. We carried signs, and we tried to promote an understanding of wolves to mostly urban folks. They took a lot of pictures of us, <laughs> which was funny. Um, uh, coexistence and tolerance in rural communities extends to wildlife in addition to human beings as they gain an acceptance of a changing lifestyle, which no longer revolves entirely around hunting and agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I'm gonna hand it over to John next to address that same question examples of personal work that have been impactful for you. Thanks, John. 
Um, yeah, so I guess um, when I was kind of thinking about this, um, one of the things that I thought of most was uh, there was a public hearing um, to extend the utility um, or to, to uh, referendum or whatever it was, it was to make sure that we didn't have to pay utilities through the winter. Um, and I got to hear a lot of people's personal testimonies in that. And I thought that was just really amazing to, to hear how brave some of these people were to like share their stories and how elegantly they could kind of convey the hardships um, that they were going through. And to do that publicly, I, it was just really moving to me. Um, and, it, and it really shows just how important being able to kind of come to terms with that and to, to share that with um, other people like that, it's, it, it does a really great job in getting policy to be enacted. Um, just because when you hear those stories, it's really hard to just kind of turn away on those people. And it really humanizes all the issues that, peop that, that people are going through. Um, so we have some amazing volunteers and there's not even just volunteers here, but there are just some amazing people in Madison and Wisconsin that are willing to share all that stuff. Um, and it's really moving to just kind of get a listen to them and see how they're going through all that. So, thanks. Thank you, John. And Emily, if you could cap things off for us with your responses to that question, examples of personal work that have been impactful for you. Yeah, um, one for me, um, I read and did the journal um, for me and white supremacy, um, which has been recommended um, in the chat by Karen. So you have two recommendations now, so you have to do it um, if you haven't. But I did that with a my work group. Um, and Jenny has it right there, so perfect. I did that with um, my team at work, which is kind of like an unheard of thing, but I worked for a great organization that encouraged that. Um, fourth from Katie, fourth, so you really have to do it now. Um, but I did it with people at work and it was it was life-changing because if you know um, what that book does, um, it really does take, well, it's, but it's you, it's about you and white supremacy, like the name would say, and it led to a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And it, my team was mostly um, white women. And a lot, we discovered a lot of what we did was stuff that we thought was nice or the right thing to do that was actually harmful and not the right thing to do. And so it was interesting to kind of go through that and be able to see that and really humble ourselves to these, the words and the things that the BIPOC community is saying we should be doing. Um, so that was really impactful. I think another one um, that I think was really impactful, just in, it's a bigger thing, but just filling my life with marginalized voices, like in my Instagram feed, just following people um, that are speaking up about topics, um, reading books um, by people from the BIPOC community and things like that you will just learn so much and you'll be transformed just through what they have to say. And um, I think just making their voices the loudest in your life um, will be transformative. It has for me through the past years, absolutely changed me. And I am very grateful for people who are talking about it because I've definitely benefited from that a lot. So those are some of the most impactful things. Great, thank you so much, Emily. And thanks so much to all of our panelists for the amazing and excellent information that you shared. Emily's comments are an excellent segue into what we're gonna talk about next. Um, just a few quick pieces of actions that you can take after attending this session. So a bunch of people have mentioned the unlearning circles that are led by Hummingbird Milwaukee. And you don't have to live in Milwaukee to participate in those. They are virtual. And uh, Hummingbird Milwaukee is led by Mandy McAllister and David Thomas and Karen Samuelson in the chat have both mentioned her and mentioned those circles. So she led some unlearning circles with this book that has been mentioned several times last spring. And she's about to launch another series of those circles. And the way that they work is when you sign up, Mandy will put you into groups and we'll have an orientation session to provide some pointers and how to run the groups. But then essentially um, you 
your group is, is left to decide how exactly you want to read the book, how many chapters that it's, or days, the book is divided into 28 days. So how many days at a time you want to do it and how often you want to meet. Um, and fortunately, David had, Thomas has put the link to sign up for those on Learning Circles into the chat already. I think Cassie is going to be adding a few other links to the chat. We have an, um, some other opportunities, bystander intervention trainings led by Hollaback. Um, and so you can follow the link that will be in the chat in a moment to that. Also, I want to put in a plug for um, with, uh, Wisconsin Chapters Volunteer Fair, Virtual Volunteer Fair, that's going to be held on February 3rd at 6.30, and that will provide you with information about how you can get involved in any of these teams that you heard about tonight. So the lands team or the wildlife team or the tar sands team or transportation or any of the other great work that you heard about, you'll be able to find out more about how to engage in that work on February 3rd. Um, I also wanna put in a plug for if you are in the Milwaukee area to get involved in Nearby Nature, and I'm gonna stick that link in the chat right there. This, that's the link to the site that uh, David Thomas shared earlier. Uh, nearby Nature is always looking for more, uh, more volunteers, and there's always plenty of activities going on and great ways to get involved. So if you go to that site, you can just click on the Get Involved tab. So again, I want to thank everybody so much for attending tonight. Um, and I also want to encourage you to feel free to reach out to chapter staff or to the panelists who, who you heard from tonight to get more information on how to become involved with the, these issues that intersect racial justice and environmental protection. Um, I feel that it's imperative for all of us to raise our voices and to help turn the tide on systemic racism. As author Beverly Daniel Tatum says, the relevant question isn't whether all whites are racist, but how we can move more people from a position of active or passive racism to one of active racism. So with that, we actually are doing um, really well on time and we have a few extra minutes and I'm going to open it up for if folks, other attendees who are here have any questions that you'd like to ask of our panelists, uh, you can either put those in the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute, um, we can call on you or feel free to just unmute yourselves and um, ask a question of any of the folks who spoke tonight. Yeah, Joanne, go ahead. Yes, um, I attended the online Zoom meeting today with the DNR and I spoke at the meeting. And um, there were a lot of people that gave really good comments from other organizations, from Clean Wisconsin and League of Wis uh, Cons Conservation Voters. But um, the bill that they have on the agenda um, still allows certain quantities of PFAS and pesticides, which of course um, still are very dangerous for human health. And they won't be detected until they get into our groundwater and they go and test for them. But regardless, it's at least um, a proposal that they will be doing better than they are now because we don't have anything to limit these quantities in our water. And anyone and everyone who feels led should um, put a comment in. I put the uh, email address on and the, um, the snail mail address on my messages that I sent to you. And you should send letters or emails um, to the DNR to see if we can get this bill passed.
Thank you, Joanne, and thanks for your act as activism. Thanks for attending that hearing today. That's great. And Jadine? It was because of my email that I, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, it was because of my email that I got from Jadine that I attended. Thank you. And I, Jadine, at representing the water team, I just wanted to see if you wanted to add anything to what Joanne just shared. Um, I don't think anything in particular. I was just going to say that I, I heard Joanne speak this morning and it was great. Um, I was really glad to hear it. And I, there was a lot of other people as well who shared a lot of um, like personal stories to do with PFAS, similar to kind of what John was talking about earlier. I feel like hearing that is always really impactful. Um, and yeah, this, this rule is really important because the federal government doesn't regulate groundwater um, directly. So um, if we want to regulate PFAS and groundwater, this is like really our big um, chance to do it. So it's super important and the comment period is open. And if anybody has questions, feel free to send me an email. I can um, put my email in the chat. Thanks, Jadine. And I just want to point out the invitation to the panelists that uh, popped up in the chat from Wesley from UW Whitewater for their diversity forum in March. So if anybody is interested in helping out with that and, and being a speaker, uh, looks like Wesley in, included their uh, email. Any other questions for our panelists? who shared such great information about all of the important work that they're doing. All right, well, I know as someone who um, spends her life practice, oh yeah, who practically spends her life on Zoom for work. I always like it when meetings end early. So we'll give you the gift of a few extra minutes tonight. I wanna thank everybody so much for coming and listening to the information that our panelists shared. And once again, many, many thanks to the panelists um, for, for all the information you shared today and all of your amazing activism and the work that you're doing around environmental justice. So thanks so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your week.